So my task was to talk to you about pastoralist networks, and this is taking more the social side angle. I will speak about what are civil society organizations and NGOs, the different roles they play, then present the pastoralist knowledge hub and the regional networks, and we hope to come up with one European regional network from these meetings, and then as the uh, issue of policies and networking has been mentioned, I will give some examples of policy processes and alliances that you may, that may be interesting for you to link up with. So, civil society and NGOs is a very related concepts and there are some fluid linkages between the two. In a very schematic way, NGOs are um, organizations that give support to a given group and the givers of support may be outsiders. Contrary to that, civil society organization is where the actors and the beneficiaries are the, from, of the same group. And in many developing countries where freedom of expression of, um, and political voice may be limited and where the state of capacities is low, communities may decide to invest in some members of their community to send them to university and then those people start an NGO attracting funds from outside to help the community to better develop economically. And, um, but when the, the development of civic rights improves, when there is more freedom of association, when groups can be empowered and so on, when the overall educational level increases and people are able to voice their concerns and get more professional in advocacy and training, then civil society may become a real broad social movement. And then the lines between NGOs and, and civil society organizations may become fluid, but, and there can be um, positive or even competitive interactions among the two. Civil society, from the FAO perspective, has, in, has increased over the past let's say 10 years, its role in international policy processes, and I'm always taking the, the global perspective. And civil society has been much more represented in many of the bodies that F, at FAO. One reason is that they can represent better the indigenous knowledge and traditions that run and, and govern their production system and livelihood systems. But on the other hand, if they are uh, recipients of, for example, technical advice and improved practices, it's up to the farmers, to the producer organizations to test those innovations in the field, to adapt them, to see whether it works, and they make change happen. Politicians only talk. And then there is a, uh, if you include civil society organizations, and a broad range of them, you may come to the real issues that underlie problems and you can come to, to ideas for solutions. In many cases, therefore, civil society has a lot of focus in advocacy because they see themselves as the motor for policy development and societal change. And one critical element is inclusiveness that within one civil society movement or across the movements, as many stakeholders as possible should be included so that there is a balanced view, a balanced representation that uh, includes the concerns of everybody but then also reaches all members of society. And there comes the challenge for pastoralist groups because they live in remote areas. They have very strong traditional uh, governance structures and clan structures and so on. They are often 
very self-sufficient in classical societies in, let's say, East Africa. They lived mostly, the biggest part of their food came from the animals. So their interaction with other parts of society was very limited. And today we find that they are very often excluded from the societal discourse of policies and development. And this becomes an issue, but on the other hand, we have now a lot of technologies which make uh, increased participation much more easily possible. Pastoralists in East Africa get market prices, climate forecasts, and so on over the cell phone. It's possible to have virtual meetings, to um, lobby together through modern technologies. And all this needs to be explored more. Networks are a first step and a movement towards a broader civil society movement, but they are not easy to and cheap to start and to maintain. And they may be disappointing because a lot of the advocacy work takes long, long time, and as we have heard in the previous talk, lobbying at various levels to reach a goal and it may take a generation to come out with results. And then there are the economic shortcomings that even in, in producer groups that are entirely technical, there is a, an issue about the cost and benefits of being member of such a group or such a network. And if we think back to Germany and to the uh, Genossenschafts movement, there were two main ways to attract people to become a member of such societies and associations. The one is to increase the benefits. So increase the income that they can get, and we have heard already a few of these points. Try to get better marketing of your products of the animals. Try to lobby and get better marketing of the services, the ecosystem services that you provide. Look for other sources of income, um, subsidies, and whatever. The other pathway would be to reduce the cost. And one way is to improve service provision. For livestock keepers in many countries, veterinary costs are a huge issue. And therefore, uh, community animal health work and veterinary ser service provision can be an, att an attraction to join an association but also legal advice, how to deal with bureaucracy, administration, how to fight for land tenure, and so on, may be an incentive. As we said, policy change is a driver for many civil society movements. Therefore, this is in the far distance, and you should not lose sight of this. Networking is critical. and. We have seen it happens at various levels, from the local, over the national, to the regional, and to the global. And uh, yeah, I said already, conditions are changing. And I think it's, it's very important to be smart and to look for opportunities in how to connect with your colleagues at national, regional, and global level. Pastoralists have come as part of civil society movements. They've come to FAO and said, we would like you to help us to organize ourselves better in policy processes at global level. And then the regional and national comes underneath. So FAO has given space to empower pastoralists, to give them more voice in, body, in their bodies, but it's also about knowledge systems that need to be captured and empowered and to enable the exchange be between traditional knowledge and scientific and uh, other knowledge and to see how practices can be improved and what type of technical advice can be given in addition to policy processes. And this is why last year we uh, started the discussion with the Germans and established this pastoralist knowledge hub. 
which has three pillars. The first pillar is a knowledge hub. So there is a knowledge repository where from the global level to the national level and local level, pastoralists all over the world are invited to upload documents, studies, cases, successes, for example, on ecosystem services provision or how they have successfully lobbied or anything they want. Um, the second pillar is the pastoralist networks themselves. And um, because the pastoralists themselves said, okay, there are meetings at FAO, usually there are a few people who attend, but are these people legitimate? Whom do they represent? How do we control what they say? The solution for this is to allow people to organize themselves in sort of regional chapters, regional networks, and see how processes from the national to the regional level can be built so that the representation works, the feedback works, and that those people who then go to global meetings, they really speak the voice of those that they represent. And for this, uh, we have done these various workshops. And then, this is not an FAO exercise, but it's, um, there are lots of partners, development partners and advocacy partners, the, the World Bank, other donors, but also uh, environment organizations and um, lobby groups are part of it. So that's how it, how it should work. There is the, the knowledge hub in the middle, which is only located at FAO, you have all these international development partners and also the NGOs that support this knowledge hub, for example, doing joint projects. If UNEP is doing something and IIED is working in the same area, we would like to connect them to have an added value. Then there are the pastoralists in various sub-regional settings or regional settings. This is decided by the pastoralists themselves, um, how they organize themselves, and they give their feedback on, as I said, studies, analysis, things they have done at uh, uh, regional or local level, and they give feedback on technologies, and the Pastoralist Hub gives capacity development and support for them to voice their concerns at the various levels. And there, it depends where you want to see. I think for the Europeans, the most important target is the European Commission and the CAP. But at global level, there are other um, agreements that are relevant for pastoralists. So we ask those pastoralist organizations that want to become member, what type of organization are you? Are you a membership organization? Who are your members? Um, what is your gender balance? Uh, do you provide services to your member? What are they? What's your geographical scope? And for whom are you working? And all this is to give some legitimacy and some um, check-ups on who is, who is representing whom. These pastoralist networks, as I said, they work in, in regional networks all over the world, and that's why we are uh, starting this process with the seven um, regional workshops. And the European one is the third one, but there are also thematic working groups, and I think what um, the European Union is doing with these innovation platforms could be a potential thematic group for the Europeans. Um, and for each, you can see here, uh, for if you zoom into the region, then those priorities that have been predefined from earlier discussions are listed on the web page and the focal points for the networks 
are there as contact points so that everybody can write emails to them. And the biggest issues that were identified for Europe in previous discussions is uh, mobility, the disruption of migration routes, farm intensification, the grassland um, management, and then conflicts between nature conservation and even, as we have heard, the, the predation issues and overall rural development issues of services and how can we how can a vibrant rural community with pastoralists be maintained? And because we are operating at the global level, I am just giving some ideas of international policy processes where issues are discussed that at the end, because at international level policies are made that at the end will be implemented at national level. And therefore, it is important to be aware and potentially also lobby those processes. And just to give some ideas, the, uh, in FAO, the Committee on World Food Security, from which the original request to create this pastoralist knowledge hub has come, will de define in its next session a, a report on sustainable agricultural development for food security and nutrition, including the role of livestock. And again, there is a consultation process going on uh, with the governments and organizations that can review those documents. And if you want to have the positive aspects of landscape conservation through livestock in this document, you have to lobby for it. You may think of having a side event of the Pastoralist Knowledge Hub at the CFS, then we would invite recommendations and ideas and who would participate. Another very related convention is the uh, Desertification Convention, which has its next meeting in Turkey in October. The issue there is land management and desertification, which means how can we maintain lands well so that they don't get this, uh, eroded, and if they are eroded, how can we rehabilitate, reestablish land and livestock production and grazing management may be a very important issue in that. Another one is the climate convention that in Paris in uh, November will decide, put hopefully, on a new international climate regime. And a lot of talk has been on the role of carbon sequestration in forests. The role of grasslands for carbon sequestration is only mentioned here and there. There is no mechanism. If you want it, you have to lobby for it. Then there is the, uh, from our technical working group on animal genetic resources for food and agriculture, there is a global plan of action for animal genetic resources that has very strong uh, references already to pastoralists and their breeds and to ecosystem services. When this will be reviewed by the end of the year, do you want stronger references to this? Make stronger linkages to climate change and so on? Then the next meeting of the Convention on Biological Diversity, which looks at biodiversity and nature conservation, but also agricultural biodiversity. The next meeting will look specifically at agricultural biodiversity and there will be a link to rangelands and drylands and to climate. That's exactly what you are talking about. So another opportunity and at another level, at FAO level, the same happens in the Commission on Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. This is just to show there are lots of processes going on. I don't think everybody has to be everywhere but it's a question of strategizing where do you want to go. Maybe you can lob negotiate the Latin Americans do this, the European shepherds go there, and then really go for it. But it also means you have to read the documents. And it's a complicated to go through all this, and, and it's real hard work and takes a long breath. 
But if you are out, you are out, and that's a problem. If it's decided at global level, then also at European level, you cannot really get out of it. So looking at potential alliances that are not the classical agriculture actors, you can look at food systems. And for example, slow food, and FO is now working with slow food, there is a lot of arc of taste and presidia where local products could be lifted up and get better visibility and potentially into other marketing chains. For indigenous food systems, there is a r relatively recent new uh, movement of the indigenous Terra Madre, with the next meeting taking place in India. And then there are the more conventional approaches of <coughs> domination of protected origin, geographic indication, and so on, where you can think of how you can add value to products and, and get a higher market value. Then there is the community empowerment aspect. Under the Convention on Biological Diversity, there is a Nagoya Protocol on access and benefit sharing. And biocultural community protocols have been tested and, and developed through a pastoralist NGO, who is representatives also present in this room. And although the original idea was to get defensive rights on genetic resources, the tool is very powerful to build communities, uh, to, to think what, what are we as a community, what have been our tradition, what makes us special, how do we want to continue our livelihoods, and how do we position ourselves in modern society. And um, there is no biocultural community protocol in Europe, and maybe it's an idea to do one, the process is very similar to the one that is requested to, to get a GI. So there are similarities in processes. And maybe not so much for Europe, but also related is a, a global process going on on the, um, the voluntary guidelines on the governance of tenure of land, fisheries, and forestry, which is a again, under the Committee on World Food Security, which gives opportunity for pastoralists in many countries to discuss their traditional rights, which are not legal rights, but to, to make a firm stance on, this has been our transhumans movement road, and we want to maintain that for these reasons, and to get a right to maintain these transhumans movements. So there are issues that are more strong in developing countries, but I think there are lessons that can be learned also for Europe. We are doing a lot of technical support, and um, yeah, there is a whole fashion at the moment to restore degraded rangeland, forest land, and uh, grasslands, even landscape rehabilitation, thinking about landscape heterogeneity indexes, which is something that would be interesting for you to work on. Uh, there are many projects working on resilience, climate change, adaptation, and conflicts, because in many pastoral, originally pastoral lands, there is very high conflict. If you think about the Sahel and the, the Horn of Africa and Central Asia, and a lot of this is related to the ne polis political neglect of pastoralists' systems and, and how they work. We, get, um, we are working with pastoralist countries on the implementation of the voluntary guidelines on tenure. And something very recent is that pastoralist countries have gone to international standard setting bodies and said the way international standards are, are set is not applicable to pastoralist systems. So we want to renegotiate international standards and how they can be applied. One area, and I know that there has been a lot of uh, discussion in the European Union, is animal identification and recording. And animal identification becomes a must, even in Africa, and it's a real challenge 
to see how this can be applied in, in a pastoral context. As Antonia had said, there are research and development needs and assessments are a, a very big need, so we need to map what we have, not only the, the ecosystem services and the grasslands, but also the transhuman routes, and we need to know what we are talking about, who is a pastoralist, there is already this confusion. If you say Schäfer, in German, this is more related to sheep. But for us, a pastoralist is a Hirte, which is everything and independent of the species. You need to translate this concept in, in the various language and then say, who is a pastoralist? How many do we have globally? What is their contribution to economy globally? And how can we, at global level, make a stronger argument for them? And then, out of this study on ecosystem services that we did, we, get st we got strong recommendations to improve assessment methods on ecosystem services provision so that ecosystem services can be valorized and result-based incentive systems can be developed. And I think this recommendation is an international breakthrough because we never had that, the recognition that there must be incentive systems. And then a recommendation on strengthening the link between big conservation and nature conservation and get out of the agriculture only corner, work with forestry, work with wildlife, work with social movements and try to maximize the benefits. So to conclude with some more ideas and proposals, the in an international pastoralist gathering in 2013 in Kiserian, in Kenya, the pastoralists recommended that the Un United Nations should develop a commission for pastoral development. And I think it's not easy to get a commission, a UN commission established with current budget constraints and so on, but maybe with a long breath one can move to something that maybe fits the same purpose. So why not starting with asking a United Nations year of pastoralism? These years off are usually going hand in hand with lots of national activities and lobbying and policy making, so they offer a lot of opportunities. But that would be lobbying your government so that the government makes a request to the United Nations so that this year will actually happen. Another advocacy idea would be uh, to have uh, more technical, an international conference on livestock landscapes and pastoralists, where lots of actors and potentially donors could come together. And then, as I said already, how can regulation be adapted to pastoralist context? And I think this is also a question for Europe. Less so than, than for developing countries, but it is an issue. So, to conclude, you can see the, the hub, and you can see the, the regional networks, and you can see a part of the, the uh, partners, but for networking, I hope I, I made clear, for effective policy work, a certain degree of professionalization is needed. All the, the, the pastoralists themselves, they are working with the animals, they are very